Hello, everybody. My name is Fernanda Perez Gay. As Pierre said, I am a postdoctoral researcher at Mayo University and I'm also a science communicator. And I will be with you for the next uh, day, three days in this uh, uh, summer school. So I will start by introducing our first speaker, which is uh, Professor Baruch Fischhoff, we, who will uh, present a talk called Making Behavioral Science Integral to Climate Science and Action. So uh, Baruch Fischhoff is a Howard Hines University professor in the Department of Engineer, Engineering and Public Policy, an Institute for Politics and Strategy and Carnegie Mellon University. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. He is past president of the Society for Judgment and Decision Making and the Society for Risk Analysis. He has chaired the Food and Drug Administration Risk Communication Advisory Committee and has been a member of the Eugene Oregon Commission of the Rights of Women, the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Advisory Committee and the Environmental Protection Agency Scientific Advisory Board where he chaired the Homeland Security Advisory Committee. His books include Acceptable Risk, Risk, A Very Short Introduction, and Counting Civilian Casualties. Without a further introduction, I will pass the mic to Professor Bridge Fischhoff. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you all for, for inviting me to this remarkable seminar. I'm sorry we didn't get to do this in person last year and to participate in today's uh, really excellent uh, Excellent program. It, trying to anticipate what the other really, I think, real terrific talks that you're going to have today. I thought try to find material that was a little that was a little a little different. So, uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, some of my personal history with with, uh, with with climate change. So that's obviously unique, and then to talk about three roles for decision science, which is the version of cognitive science psychology that uh, that that I practice. And then finally, talk about if, if uh, capacity building, if this was a kind of research that uh, that people found interesting and useful. So first, climate change and me. So my introduction to climate change was through a group of geographers who had been working this problem in the mid 1970s and uh, kind of bringing together of people in psychology, geography and risk analysis. There was a special issue of Environment magazine uh, uh, edited by Robert Harris, uh, Chris Hohenemser, and Bob Cates uh, on, on treating the environment as hazard as a way of thinking about uh, sort of bringing our world's world together. Uh, Bob, Chris, and I, and, and Roger Kasperson um, had, a, had a chapter trying to bring our worlds together. With that, or that, we didn't actually do research, but we had to figure out what we might do a major opportunity seemed to present itself the next next year when the, our, the US Department of Energy contracted with the US, with the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science to develop a 20 year a program of research in, in dealing with possible CO2 induced uh, climatic, uh, climatic change. Um, uh, it had just a remarkable steering group. So people interested in climate will know Roger Ravel. People interested in women's history and sociology might know will might know Elise Elise Boulding. Lester Lay was one of the first economists to price air air pollution. Steve Schneider would be known probably to everybody in uh, in, in in climate. And interesting to think about how this community conceptualized this world. Uh, 42 years ago. Uh, so there were five working groups, one on uh, sometimes climate science, environmental effects on the oceans, cryosphere, and ocean biota. Then one on environmental effects on the less managed biosphere and on the managed biosphere with uh, the biologists recognizing that there's not very much that's not managed in some way on, on our planet. There was a panel on social and institutional responses and a, se a separate panel on, on economic and geopolitical consequences, we were part of, 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 panel, uh, of panel four. So in some sense, we potentially had 20% of, uh, of, 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 the, of the action. Um, uh, our panel, you could sort of, I don't, I don't know how many of these names will be familiar to people, it was intellectually very diverse, uh, uh, divide, uh, diverse uh, group. Uh, uh, Bob Chen, who's still active, some of you may know him. Actually, Bob and I 
both had sons who became evolutionary biologists and worked on the fourth national uh, climate uh, assessment. And, and, and the wisdom of, of, of the organizers is they brought a, they invited somebody from Iceland who's still active, Harald the Olafsson, who had studied the demise of the Nordic or European community in Greenland during the Little Ice Age in order to take, advan take advantage of his uh, interdisciplinary uh, approach to things, which is more typical of smaller countries than larger countries where we have opportunity, more opportunities to, uh, to uh, speciate, but also to make the point that the European uh, developed world uh, uh, societies were vulnerable to, to climate change. Uh, we had a statement, I've sent ahead the, the slides if anybody would want, want to read it. This was the summary statement from our group. It pretty much reads, it reads today the way it read uh, 40 some years ago. And it calls for uh, unprecedented interdisciplinary research, eff research effort. Um, we all met at uh, the Annapolis, uh, Maryland Hilton. Hotel still stands, somebody else has the franchise. At that time, the, the uh, international program was coordinated under the Global Atmospheric Research Program, or GARP, and coincidentally, this book had just come out, and there was a uh, bookstore uh, uh, around the corner from, the, uh, from, from our meeting, uh, which featured this book in its front, uh, front window, so it really felt as though yeah, the, the world had, gar this, we were going to be under, understood. Uh, it seemed very enthusiastic. I had, an, I had an opportunity to attend a multidisciplinary meeting at, at, the, at the Vanderbilt that John Hardy, Harvey did. I wrote this paper here, uh, which listed basically the things, it was basically a task analysis of what, um, of what what we are able to to contribute to this to this uh, this problem, um, uh, Bob Chen, uh, Elise, and Steve pulled together a volume of of of, of uh, working papers from the from our of papers from our working group laying out the research agenda. Came out in 1983. At that point, the research agenda was completely dead. That uh, that with the, that it basically it died on uh, January twentieth, nineteen eighty one, with the inaugural inauguration of the new new president, and um, uh, Lita and I wrote. I, I recruited Lita, who's a cross cultural developmental psychologist and 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 and, uh, uh, and me methodologist, because I realized I didn't have that that dimension. We wrote a chapter that again had a task analysis of the things that we do that we thought were essential to making progress in, uh, in, in, in climate uh, science. These will all be familiar topics to, to all, all of you. So during that period in the United, United States, the natural sciences, which had uh, an installed base, they had programs which didn't grow, weren't cut that badly, maybe grew slowly as, as the political shock wave was, uh, was processed. They managed to keep going, but there was, by my reading, almost no attention to the social dimensions of, uh, of, 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 cli of climate change. Uh, um, I'll be curious to hear what Tom Deeds has to say. <laughs> About this as having been a, a, a partisan at that uh, at, at, at that at that point at that point, among the few things that were going on were Willard Kempton had this remarkable multi method approach on environment uh, environmental values in American culture, in which climate change played an important role. Uh, we had a small project kind of bootleg from other research looking at people's mental models of climate change that came out in the early 1980s, basically had our methodology of doing quali structured qualitative research followed by quantitative uh, research. And throughout this period, John Krosnick, who's at, uh, was at Ohio State then, was at, is at Stanford now, somehow managed to cobble together uh, a uh, um, 
surveys on public attitude towards climate at a time that most people in the social sciences were not paying attention and were certainly not funded to, to, do, to do this. By my estimation, 20 years, two decades, maybe a quarter of a century passed until, oh, I mean, one other thing that was going on during that, that time is that the National Academy of Sciences convened a committee on human dimensions of, of global change. Uh, it was really a fantastic committee. So many of these uh, names will be familiar to, to, to people. Um, uh, we had a, a, a joint book that came out in 1992, which, which it had a, as, as reports from our National Academy sometimes do, had a kind of legitimating, fun, legitimating function for this kind of, kind of research. And uh, but perhaps the thing I learned most from, or one of the things that I learned most from being on this committee was from Aaron, Eric Barron, who's uh, just retiring as president of Penn State University and is a, uh, a noted climate, climate scientist. He said that the, the social sciences will not gain traction in this era, area unless they do big science that's integrated with the big natural science research programs, that the kind of single investigator or small lab research that we do producing independent papers that accumulate slowly will not play. It will just won't, we won't get traction in a world that's dominated by the climate uh, modelers and the large scale observation systems. And I think he was right. Um, oh, I, as my reading as, a, as a, an amateur historian, one of the things that began to change was that Gus Speth, who's a remarkable environmentalist, and I think at that time was head of the Yale School of Forestry and Natural Resources, had been on uh, head of the Council of e U.S. Council of Economic Qualities, got intensely interested in this, had an amazing uh, I guess Rolodex, Rolodexes still exist, Gus seemed to know and be respected by everybody. And he convened uh, really a remarkable interdisciplinary, intersectoral group, religious figures, politicians from different parties, philanthropists, natural and social scientists, uh, leading to this book, which came out in 2007 that Dan Abbasi uh, uh, edited, I think still reads pre pretty well and, and made the case that we all need to work together, that um, to his credit, Gus um, gave the social sciences equal attention to the natural sciences. The natural sciences were typically a, a series of meetings with Richard Somerville, uh, Steve Schneider, and a, and a rotating group, a set of third people. And on the social sciences was John Krosnick, uh, Skip Lupia, and, and myself. So he really opened the door to us and, and did a kind of a legitimation that we could not have done on, on, on its own. Some of what we have now uh, as a collective research for the social and behavioral sciences, as well as for the worldwide community, are the Yale Climate Connections that Tony Lazarowitz runs, the George Mason Center that Ed Maybach runs, which are direct descendants of, uh, of the, this Gus's effort in the mid 2000s as well as uh, Climate Central. Uh, not direct, not a direct descendant, but also noteworthy for, if you're unfamiliar with it, as a climate advocacy lab, which has, I think, a, which we've done some work with in the, in, in the past, which has a remarkable, a really interesting model for, uh, for bridging, for making the social behavioral sciences accessible to, uh, to, uh, to advocates, most of their work is behind a, behind a, um, uh, a firewall, but if you ask for permission, they'll let you, I'm guessing they'll let you, they'll let you, let you in. And, um, and, and another opportunity that, that I commend to people here is that the U.S. has a, a global change research program, which is the amalgamation of kind of a consortium of most, but not all, of the U.S. government agencies that um, that work on climate-related uh, related issues, our National Academy 
has a uh, committee that advises the US GCR, GCRP and uh, that I'm just, just rotating off. And we brought out this report. So the, the GCR, the Global Change Research Program is in the midst of, it, of planning its, its next 10 years of, of work. We were asked to send them uh, um, to, to provide, provide advice. And it's a, I think it's a pretty readable report after, after considerable editorial pain and it features strong roles for the social sciences and for in integrated multi uh, uh, interdisciplinary, not just multidisciplinary work. And, and Tom, who will speak later today, had a major, uh, major role in making this happen. So, so although I would say this, this, my, this personal history, much of it has been, these were, there were many fallow years where, where I think the natural science community let other people define climate change rather um, and, and I would like to believe that we could have uh, 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 helped to put us in a better place today. There does seem to be some, some openness for, um, for, for work that, that we do if we can fit into ourselves into that world. So and now I'd like to talk about three roles for decision science, which is one of the which is what I do, which is one of the ways of translating between the disciplinary science and the more applied science of in that, that climate change often uh, often requires. So, uh, and and you can uh, read about some of this history if you're interested. Read about some of this history and more uh, uh, with about this in the in this uh, paper, which which I sent ahead before the meeting. So, there are three roles where I believe that we can provide facility that we can facilitate which complement and, and sometimes overlap of what you'll be hearing from the other talks today. So one is translating behavioral research into analysis friendly terms. Uh, the second is treating the analytical process as a behavioral enterprise. And third, uh, making climate research more relevant. So this decision science, which may not be familiar, this is a uh, sort of um, an intersection between um, analytical and behavioral research, where if we do our job right, we analyze problems in some formal sense to find out, to understand what are the decisions that people face, what's the information that's relevant to them, whether it's climate or biology or economics, uh, or mental health or whatever, descriptive research, how do people Deal with, deal with those decisions currently and interventions. How can we help people to make um, better, better decisions? The default assumption in this area is one of empowering people to make better decisions, and but but recognizing there are places where it isn't working and other interventions more persuasive and other are are, are needed. This is an iterative process. Uh, if you're, you can't help people, then maybe you haven't understood the people or maybe you haven't understood the, understood the problem. And we have, uh, uh, actually, I mean, there are many people working on this, the people I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, we've often had the opportunity to work with people, who, with, to be approached by people who own the problem and were looking for some kind of help. So we've had over the years opportunity to apply this basic paradigm uh, in a variety of different ways where, where the analytical and descriptive science can be interpreted in each of these directions in, in different ways. So the basic discipline of science provides the foundation for the research and the application raise new problems. So the basic science is better off, uh, not just by making itself useful, but also by seeing problems that, uh, that we might not have seen just moving endogenously from our own research. So a summary of this, if people are interested, is, is a, um, it was a special, there were joint special issues of nature, climate change, and nature, uh, nature energy in 2016. I believe it was the launch of nature energy. Nature climate change was the first of the nature, I believe was the first of the nature journals started in 2011. That that assigned that that assigned and a place to and even welcomed the social and behavioral science. So this paper talks about uh, we in order to present the approach. This was done by grad. Uh, I should 
I'll mention, let me mention them by name. Um, so Daniel, Daniel, Alex, and Tamar were all graduate students or postdocs. Gabe, uh, Tamar and, and Gabrielle were both postdocs. Uh, Tamar's at the University of Pittsburgh. Alex is at CMU. Daniel's at the University of Chile. And Gabrielle is at, uh, is, is, is at Stanford. In order to lay out the rationale of what we did, we said, well, we had case studies looking at three different areas. And then we show this, this is what the formal analysis, descriptive analysis and intervention uh, uh, look, looks like. So one, so that's, this is what the behavioral sciences and I'll show some snippets from that research and then from research from some, some other areas that will give you a feeling for the texture of what, what we can do. So this is a world as many of you will know, or maybe as all of you will know, that is driven by uh, driven by models. These are large scale models, very with multiple inputs, very hard to audit. Uh, this is from a meeting at the academy, our, our academy last fall, on uh, on socioeconomic shared socioeconomic pathways. This was the vision of the climate modelers on how to think about social about social uh, variables. But they can only think about social variables to the extent that they are expressed in model friendly terms. So you can think about population, those you got those data, think about some some economic variables are available in model friendly terms, but most of the behavioral sciences is, are not. And, um, and because this is a human enterprise, people who don't speak its language just get get lost. So I thought I'd quickly show a a couple of projects in other domains showing uh, strategies for translating what we know about behavior into model friendly terms. So as some of you will know, we have been studying human behavior for, uh, for a very long time. Here's a, a paper that, um, that uh, a book from 1921 that, uh, that one of my former graduate students, uh, Casey Canfield found um, it has quantitative analyses of things like the effect of, of, of productivity of, of shift work uh, in a field experiment in a steel furnace in the early 19, uh, 1910s. It had, has an analysis of hourly output as a function of time of day for women covering chocolates, which I guess was a gendered profession at, at, that, at that time. Um, I think I'll, here, if, if you're if you're interested in the slides, this is a uh, slide I, a, a slide showing people's productivity as a function of working very long shifts uh, for long periods of, of of time. So, so here this was part of Casey's dissertation. Uh, she was interested in um, uh, in how vulnerable people are to phishing phishing attacks. Uh, this is an area where human behavior is 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 really critical, but it's not expressed in terms that people that people who have to make the business case for investing in uh, cybersecurity, say for pipelines, um, you know, or for the Democratic National Committee in the 2016 election. Uh, it, you don't have numbers, you can't make make the case. So, the, but we really know a lot about vigilance, about people's ability to stay, to focus on, on tasks. So Casey, who's an engineer, reviewed the research literature on, on vigilance and created an empirical paradigm, uh, an experimental paradigm, which is what, what psychologists uh, do, where you could characterize people's um, performance in phishing detection and signal detection theory terms. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with signal detection theory, it's a standard approach developed in acoustics, electrical engineering, and psychology, roughly the, the, the same time, that says any decision is a reflection of, of, of a categorical decision. Say this is easily, most easily understood. This is phishing or this is not a phishing um, task can be characterized in terms of people's sensitivity, that is, can they tell? And then their response bias is that, how much do they care about the different, uh, getting things right or, or wrong? And Car Casey was able to show 
that uh, she used two different tasks. The details are in the are in the papers to look at the robustness of the result, and found that in a convenient sample, um, there was exceptionally large large variation in people's uh, sensitivity and their response uh, response bias. So she had one convenient sample. Obviously, parameter estimates on a convenient sample are vulnerable. She had an opportunity, thanks to other work being done by some of our colleagues at Car Carnegie Mellon, to, um, to have another convenient sample, as well as the opportunity for some ground truthing. Uh, so we had, I think it, it has just closed a security behavior observatory that ran for a number of years in which uh, people in computer science and engineering and public policy coordinated through Scilab um, uh, got people to agree to have spyware put on their computers in order to observe how vulnerable they were to phishing attacks, malware, and other things. So, and, and you know, other forms of, uh, uh, how good were their cyber security uh, uh, defenses? Uh, Casey uh, replicated the study that, that she had done with the first convenient sample with this convenient sample, but then had access to this information about actual system performance that she could then compare with people's performance on her on her task, which is a form unusual form of external validation that we that we had access to, and this is the pre-registration of her her analyses. Um, we had uh, again the paper available for people interested in the in the details. This turned out to be a sobering experience that um, people um, that, sh I mean, the, 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 the performance patterns replicated in this new sample, but we, my mostly she, could not correlate how people, well people did on the task and how well they did, how, how vulnerable they were to cybersecurity uh, threats. And so, and in a construct validity sense, well, maybe it was a bad test, or or maybe it was maybe it was a bad ex, um, task, and maybe it was a poor test. And in the end, we 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 concluded, with the help of our colleagues in computer science, that as detailed as the data that they had, it did not provide a clean test of how good people were at defending themselves. That there's so many variables that affect what you've got on, what junk you've got on your computer that in effect, reality had failed, had failed us. Um, and, um, and, and this has turned out to be a kind of a general, you know, not an uncommon problem for people who, situation when, where we try to take laboratory tasks and, and put them in complicated real world settings. Uh, uh, late last fall, um, late last year, I was asked by the, um, by the uh, heads of the, the Cochrane collaboration. If you're, not, if you're not familiar with it, it's worth learning about. It's like the world's source of, of, uh, of systematic re of reviews and methodological tutorials, really an amazing organization. And they had just uh, uh, completed, they were about to report out a systematic review of behavioral interventions uh, designed to reduce the risk of, of COVID-19. COVID and there had been, there had been many such studies. Um, there had uh, some of them, there had been one in, in uh, Guinea, or maybe Guinea-Bissau, and one in Denmark that had very large uh, uh, samples, and they had found nothing. And uh, and what sort of, sort of came out, and they they uh, you know, either that you know, so I kind of helped helped them some to to tell the story was that the world was just too complicated to give a clear signal about how behavioral effects effects work. And one, 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 you know, as with cybersecurity, that one really needed a, a, a model in order to that that looked at the different pieces of 
of what we know about the, the different pieces of the complicated puzzle in order to know what the effect, in order to situate the effects of behavioral interventions in a larger social, technical, political uh, system. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, I'll show you very briefly, I'll show you the outline of a very different approach, but it, that shows the, the kind of community of, you know, that one needs and is exciting if you can find it to do, uh, to do this kind of integration of our work in a technical community. So Donna Riley was another grad student. She's now head of engineering education at, um, at, at Purdue. We were approached by the US uh, Consumer Protection, uh, Consumer Product Safety Agency and the US Environmental Protection Agency and the Chlorine Council about whether you, about the safety of methylene chloride based pain stripper, asking whether, whether labels would, in putting la warning labels would induce safe behavior. So that's, that's what it looks like. It is really nasty stuff. Um, in order to, to estimate the effects, this is the analysis part, Donna created an air pollution model together with Mitch Small, another one of our, one of our, our colleagues, talking about the diffusion of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, what volatilizes, the gases that volatilize out of, out of, um, of, of uh, paint stripper while, while it's curing. She developed a model. Uh, she then interviewed people at a hardware store to find out how they typically used it, and then modeled the exposure that that they would get both cumulative exposure and peak, which leads to cancer among other things, and peak exposure, which leads to heart attacks, um, and then model that, and then tried to figure, and then since we didn't have the ob opportunity to observe people in their homes and see how they actually use the label, postulated different ways that people might use, use labels based on the results from the warning label re research and try to estimate, uh, given the models and given assumptions about behavior, how effective the different product labels would be for people who had different label reading behaviors. So this is again, a, a strategic approach to integrating the social and behavioral sciences in terms that could you know, that would affect, uh, uh, that were relevant to people who in a, in a part of the world that runs by, uh, run, runs by numbers. And, and here's the, the, uh, the paper that, a summary, pa a summary of, a, of, a, of a, set of a set of papers. So moving back to uh, climate related things, the, uh, after the crash and financial crash of 2007 and eight, uh, the Obama administration pushed through the American Resource Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act it included a, a, a commitment to um, to putting smart meters uh, in, in in people's in, in people's homes, and somebody in the Department of Energy included a requirement that you have behavioral expertise in this. And one our one of our colleagues, Lester Lave, who was I mentioned uh, early in the talk. Had, was friends with the, the CEO of Pepco, which is the DC area uh, utility, and they included us in their pro, in their proposal, and uh, we think we helped them to to win. Uh, they were, I say, they're not accustomed to working with behavioral researchers. On the other hand, they had some remarkable access to uh, to to, uh, to to data. So let me show you again how we, as decision and now analysts people's decision scientists approach this question. So this is one of the topics in the, um, uh, in that uh, nature climate, summarized in the nature climate change. Uh, so this was uh, about 10 years ago. There were at that point, 30 or 40 papers on the effectiveness of different kinds of in-home interventions through, um, uh, it meant to affect re uh, electricity use, either conservation, how much people use overall, or peak shaving is uh, how much people use at a time when there's great load on the, on the grid. It was 
almost all in the gray literature of, of, uh, technical, of technical reports. And Alex and Tamar, who, who did, found everything that was, tried to find everything that was out there, discovered that most of it was really terrible, that the, it was a, 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 like a terrible methodologi methodologically, um, which is a risk when things, you know, a greater risk when, when things are published in the, uh, in, in the gray literature. So something that, that we knew um, was from the Cochrane collaboration uh, that, that there are so many medical clinical trials that Cochrane reviews that they come up, they have a set of standards for evaluating the quality of the, of the, um, uh, of, of, of the studies when they aggregate them. And, those who are familiar with Robert, work of Robert Rosenthal and his colleagues in the 1960s and 1970s will know that this is much in the spirit of methodologies that in some ways actually originated in psychology, but have been perhaps adopted much more uh, enthusiastically in, uh, in, 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 med in medicine. And one of the things that they have found is that there are biases in studies. So the result of a study can be biased if you have volunteers, can be biased whether you conceal the, uh, the assignment condition, it can be biased whether people are blinded to the, um, to the condition that they're, to, that they're in, it could be, it could be, effect, it could be, there can be bias, you know, as opposed to what you would get if you had a perfect study without any of these, these problems. And uh, there are enough studies with and without the bias that people have um, been able to, uh, to estimate the magnitude of the of 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 the, of the bias, uh, and so what Alex Tamar did is they characterized these these studies in terms of the the degree of bias, uh, used the adjustment factors from the clinical trials, assuming that electricity that behave these behavioral trials would have the same bias as the others, and found that if you adjusted them, that the peak shaving shavings were half of what they would have been, of the, uh, what they were claimed to be, and that there were no conservation effects at all. Um, so something that almost nobody had studied was the Hawthorne effect, which again will be familiar to you. And this was part of Daniel Schwartz's dissertation where we added, Falas Sao was a, an econometrician who we, who we added to, looked at it and uh, whether there are Hawthorne effects. So some, I don't know if this is part of the curriculum, that it, 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 uh, where this is part of the curriculum, but the Hawthorne effect is, is the earliest study of, of uh, among the earliest studies of industrial organization started in, and, and, and looked at changes in behavior due to just being in a, in a study. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating study that Daniel uh, learned about. It's not clear just given what we've learned about methodological problems over the last century almost, not clear that there was a Hawthorne study at Hawthorne. So also, there are very few replications of Hawthorne because it's hard to do a study where, where you don't tell anybody what they're doing, what, what the study is, so you're not persuading them in some way. But Daniel was able, able to do this. He just, thanks to our collaboration with PEPCO, he sent people uh, a postcard a week for five weeks saying that they were in the study because they had smart meters. We had access to their, their usage data. Uh, thanks to Saul, to, to Fala Saul, we did some sophisticated econometrics uh, looking at different ways of modeling the change in, in behavior and found that these for the month that we did it, these postcards led to a 2.7% reduction in, uh, in, in these um, uh, in their electricity use, and since we had a gigantic sample, it was obviously really, uh, anyways. Um, so I'll talk very briefly about about about, uh, about the these other two things. So second, is you wanted that this is a human exercise. Um, so if you have a model, uh, you have parameters in, in it. Those parameters reflect human judgment. Um, there is in our field, and this is a really good point of access, uh, work on how to elicit judgments from, from people. And, but then the models themselves 
somebody decides what goes in them and what doesn't. So here are some slides from this workshop that I mentioned last last fall. These are these uh, summaries that uh, that the modelers believe would be useful to to policymakers, but it was quite seemed clear to me that that they had, with the exception of some wonderful work by Cynthia Rosenzweig in, in uh, West Africa, that they had very little connection with actual actual uh, um, um, policymakers, and the coin of their realm was uh, was pi was papers, and they had a large enough community that that sharing their papers and comparing models was self sustaining without, as far as I could tell. Uh, much impact on on, on 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 climate change. So, my suggestion to them were that this human enterprise should not presume to know what information people need without talking to them. They should re envision the work with equity as the organizing principle and goal because they never measure equity, and they should conduct a counterfactual history whereby they had they had followed the promise of the AAA as DOE project and actually had social behavioral science in from the from the beginning. And the final question is making our final task is making research more decision relevant. And um, I mean, I think was, we have some, I think you'll have some really excellent talks on this during 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 the, the day. And rather than show some of them, I was the example I was going to give was a collaboration that we did with Climate Central that's not very nicely summarized by work that uh, Gabrielle and uh, Ben Strauss, who's uh, I think currently the COO of Climate Change, did of decluttering a very unwelcoming welcome page to something much, uh, much cleaner. There's actually a, a really nice video online of uh, a, a dramatized interaction between them doing the, uh, doing the, the work. Excuse me, so let me use my final, you have five minutes left. Yeah. So let me use my final final five minutes for uh, to talk about uh, how do you bring off the, the kind of collaboration that you need need there. And I think this is really difficult. We failed 40 some years ago in November 2016. I helped to organize a a, uh, a workshop on building communication capacity to counter infectious disease threats, which would have been very relevant for the current period. Uh, it was the National Academy's uh, my, my Forum of Microbial Threats. Tony Fauci was our dinner guest. We had everybody, all the players there internationally, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing happened. So to do this, we need staff, internal coordination, external coordination and inst institutional incentives. So one way to think about the staffing is to build an influence diagram, which will, or Bayesian belief network, one of those may be familiar to you, saying, well, what are the factors that influence the outcomes that you're interested in? This is a graphic, uh, graphic depiction. And if you don't have people who represent each of those graphs, each of these nodes and their links, then you're missing people expertise that you need. And this is from a 20, 15 year old paper on pandemic, uh, pandemic disease. And if you need a lot more expertise, more diverse forms of expertise to look at behavioral interventions than in pharmacological ones. Second thing is internal coordination. As you all know, there are problems, there's a big difference between multidisciplinary work research where, where you have parallel play and interdisciplinary research where people actually work together. Uh, we had, a, for a number of years, I ran a, 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 a center of human dimensions of global change and our sponsor, uh, our program officer sponsored a, um, uh, uh, social, social, uh, uh, social network analysis of six of the, of the interdisciplinary or should have been interdisciplinary <laughs> centers that he was funding, finding out who talks to, to who and had this really nice technical report. And you could think, well, who should be talking to, uh, uh, to who? Who should have close and collegial relationships? Third, the next, next element in your capacity is external coordination. Uh, who do you, who are your clients? So uh, 25 years ago, I was on I the honor of being on the first academy report on environmental justice. 
was the, it was I think the only majority minority committee I've ever been I've ever been on. As a result, we had we were sort of welcomed by affected communities who expressed deep distrust of scientists. They they hated the lawyers most worse, but uh, we were worse. Science scientists were worse than the employers who. who made lives miserable for them, but at least provided some jobs and sometimes some, some taxes. So as well, two of our three recommendations were on community engagement. And how do you do this? This is a, a figure that's actually from uh, the Canadian Standards Organization, Q850 from 1998, which I think is the best depiction that, that I have seen of the need for consistent communication throughout a process, tell people what you're doing, find out what people think is the problem, tell people what you're doing and stay in touch all along. Not easy to do it, you need really the kind of expertise that somebody like Tom has in order to bring, uh, to, uh, to bring, it, bring it off. Our Food and Drug Administration has, uh, is noteworthy for a government agency for doing this, no part because they have people with our kind of expertise internally, they have a statutory risk communication advisory committee. They have a regular uh, protocol for talking to people in affected communities about diseases where they want or conditions where they, they want to know how people who are suffering from the disease want to have them regulated. You can, uh, Sarah Eggers, one of my former PhD students has been running this. You can find these online. And then finally, uh, these are really difficult problems. They need the best of our basic researchers working on them. Uh, but to expect them to do that, they need institutional incentives. And somehow we need to have uh, academic institutions that reward people who both publish in top, top journals and demonstrate their usefulness. I think I'll stop right here. I have a few slides of, of, of places that have brought this off to 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 uh, to varying degrees. So thank you. I really welcome your questions. I see that the, the number has been going up in the chat. So uh, uh, Fernando, do you would you want to send the questions my way or should I? Uh, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fischer, for your talk.